day two of the session. Good afternoon, Professor Ghosh. How are you? Good afternoon, sir. You are un you are not mute. You are muted. Good Please afternoon, unmute sir. yourself. Oh yeah, yeah. Ganpati, you are here. Okay, great. Uh, we have we are go uh, another program is going on. It starts at three o'clock. Okay. Yesterday it went on to after six, even more than three hours. All right, all right. <laughs> it is all. Uh, we also uh, yesterday uh, even our program <laughs> was very quite late, around okay. five forty-five. I think we signed up. Yes, ah, yes. Okay, okay. Satam Misra, huh? Gee, okay, great. So, uh, so today you have so, a lineup of speakers. Yes. Yes, sir. Hmm. So, okay. Huh? Start. Yes. Yeah, Shreya, so over to you. Okay. Thank you. Th thank you, ma'am. Uh, so, yeah. good after everyone. Uh, my name is Shreya Stivedi and. Uh, here in an IDM, I'm working at the position of junior consultant. And uh, let me give you a quick, quick recap of your study session. So Dr. Ganesh Yadav, who is assistant professor at SPS College, was moderator of the session. He is today also the moderator of the session. Uh, so the yesterday session was started with the keynote speech of our guide and our mentor, Professor Chandan Gosar. He is the head of our research, uh, resilient infrastructure division in an IDM. So, sir, welcomed the participant and gave a brief about the NIDM functioning. He advised that we all should possess a supreme spirit of a learner and always try to learn something new. So, after his speech, uh, Dr. Garima, ma'am, uh, who is a senior consultant in our division in NIDM, she set, the, she set the tone of the event and gave a brief idea about the topic. She emphasized on the role and responsibilities of an institution to create a better resilient infrastructural environment which just not support the self but also help the nearby region as well and after that uh, professor poonam ma'am she is from uh, cdms she is head there center disaster management studies uh, sbs college so bhagat singh college joined the program he was uh, she was a little late due to some technical issues and she uh, she welcomed all the participants and panelists in her welcome speech, she talked about the framework and actions that focused on designing and strengthening the community infrastructure. She also shared her view on enhancement of disaster risk reduction and disaster preparedness plans. And then we started our session. So our first session was on fire resilience in educational buildings, uh, challenges and solution. Our speaker was Mr. R.C. Sarma. He is a former director of Delhi Fire Services and he introduced the fire resilience in education buildings and highlighted the classification utility fire safety requirements for educational buildings he also shared some case studies associated with evacuation plans from delhi and haryana states and shared the information about the various tools used during fire disasters after the session professor anil sardana sir came and congratulated to the participants and the organization of uh, organizers sir. Uh, for uh, this event and then next session was started it was on understanding hazard vulnerability and risk conceptualization understanding the vulnerability profile of country and delhi and what is the institutional structure and our speaker was mrs dolphy raman she is an independent consultant uh, who work in this field she presented detailed information on dm profile along with type of various disasters uh, which occur in our countries and their distributions she also discussed the legal framework of disaster management 2005 and uh, after every session there was a question and answer session with the participants and uh, there were around 120 participants joined uh, yesterday and i hope that today also the number will increase so that was uh, for today uh, yesterday session and uh, for today i'm uh, I'm uh, requesting Dr. Uh, Ganesh Yadav to start the session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Shreyas. Uh, good afternoon, all the respected panelists, participants, and students. Welcome to this day two of our training program. This session is on earthquake safety and resilience, and we have uh, one of the finest speakers. Uh, speaker for this session is Professor G.P. Ganpati, sir. At present, Professor G.P. Ganpati is working as professor at Center for Disaster Mitigation and Management, Vellore Institute of Technology, Vellore, Tamil Nadu, India. Professor Ganpati graduated from 
College of Engineering Gundi Anna University Chennai in India in the year 1997 and completed his masters from the same university in applied geology discipline. He completed his doctoral research in earthquake microzonation from Chennai city at Anna University Chennai India. Dr. Ganapati served for Center for Disaster Mitigation and Management Anna University Chennai for 8 years as a scientist. Later on, he moved to Center for Disaster Mitigation and Management Vellore Institute of Technology, Vellore, Tamil Nadu. Dr. Ganpati served as Director for Center for Disaster Mitigation and Management, Vellore Institute of Technology, VIT, Tamil Nadu, from the year 2015 to 2020. Sir has received a special award for contribution to disaster District Disaster Management Authority, DDMA Vellore, and received various fellowships including United Nations Office of the Outer Space Affair, Vienna Fellowship, INAE Fellowship for mentoring faculty in landslide disaster risk, International Network of Crisis Mappers, Crisis Mappers Net, ICCM Fellowship 2016, etc. has handled 15, uh, 14 funded research projects and more than 30 consultancy projects on disaster mitigation and management and mining. Dr. Ganpati published more than 60 research papers in reputed international and national journals. So we are really delighted to have you, sir. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you. before Dr. Ganapati uh, takes over the floor, uh, I raise my hand uh, here, not questioning that what uh, he is or he has been, just only adding few things that on my personal account, uh, that Ganapati uh, is uh, very, very effective and uh, very inspiring teacher and researcher in disaster management. Uh, if we say that we are living in the north part of India uh, and an IDM is here, and if we take south part of India, uh, then uh, if, you, if we talk in the academic area that uh, anything about the disaster management, uh, then Ganapati comes uh, in the in uh, in the first account uh, for his contribution <laughs> in the uh, association. And another thing is uh, Ganapati uh, is now with uh, for uh, 2015 onward uh, uh, spearheading that uh, disaster management center at Valor Institute of Technology. In 2015, means six seven years back, uh, nobody have heard of even uh, creating a center for disaster management and which is uh, which has given uh, or created in 2004 i think ganapati yes sir yes sir by no other than our uh, last year's uh, netaji was apada prabandhan uh, awardee this year of course three of them uh, <clears throat> km singh uh, who is a member and then <clears throat> NDMA, former member MDMA. In fact, he was the man that who has uh, uh, given a lot of things in creating the NDMA, uh, what it was in 2005 after the uh, Disaster Management Act came out. And then uh, Professor VK Sharma, uh, who is now an emeritus professor with Indian Institute of Public Administration. And then uh, uh, Dr. R.K. Bhandari, uh, who created this center in 2004 itself. And he is the recipient of last year, but uh, physically uh, the award is given this time uh, on 23rd uh, January. So that way, uh, the spirit of uh, Dr. R.K. Vandari is being carried forward by Ganapati and his team. So this is what that I wanted to. Uh, Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you Dr. Chandan Ghosh, a uh, good friend. I'm regularly following his Facebook page uh, uh, with a lot of information. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, first, I would like to thank uh, our NIDM for this wonderful opportunity uh, to share my experience over here in this forum. And uh, Dr. Poonam Sharma, uh, Dr. Ganesh, Dr. Garima, Dr. Kavita, and other colleagues. Uh, Straight away, I don't want to waste my time, so straight away we'll I'll start.
sharing my session. Is it visible? Yes, sir. Is it okay? Right? Yes, sir. Fine. Okay. So, uh, I think uh, Dr. Chandan Ghosh already is an expert in this area. So, always uh, he, he used to tell about a lot of, uh, you know, earthquake prediction and earthquake early warning in recent days. I, even I used to attend all his, whenever I see in NIDM's lecture, then uh, I register myself still, you know, I can say, uh, uh, within the last two years, I have attended more than 40 NIDM training programs and webinars, online programs. Uh, so I'm a, a great fan of uh, Dr. Chandan Ghosh also. And thank you, sir. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about uh, this earthquake safety and resilience. And uh, I'm going to share some of my experience also what we are doing in VIT, particularly on educational institutions on uh, disaster resilience aspects and other uh, other works, whatever we are carried out. And uh, is my slide is moving? Uh, sir, yes, sir. Is it moving? Yes, yes sir. sir. Okay, all right. So uh, uh, these are all some of the historical earthquakes. Uh, if you see the year, like, you know, this is in 18, uh, 1,138. Uh, death toll is somewhere around 2.3 lakhs people. Uh, this is in Syria. And uh, this is in Tangshan earthquake in 1976, 2.4 lakhs people died. And this is 1556, about 8.3 lakhs people died in Sanshai. And uh, this is 1906, you are say the death toll is somewhere around 3000 uh, and uh, it's a 7.8 magnitude earthquake and 524 million dollar loss. This is again in uh, um, uh, 25,926 uh, deaths and these are all some of the uh, uh, you know uh, various disasters which has happened uh, earthquakes uh, happen all over the world and if you see the magnitude and death and the uh, loss like 8.3 magnitude 1, 1 lakh 42,000 uh, death and uh, 2,800 million dollar like that so if you keep on seeing this like the uh, the magnitude and death toll is almost uh, you know uh, about 30,000 to 40,000 in everywhere. Uh, even uh, you, you can see this one like the, this is only a 5.9 magnitude earthquake, uh, and uh, the death toll is somewhere around uh, uh, 12,000, and it costs 120 million. So we have higher magnitude earthquake, and uh, the, the the great loss of lives also happen in in lakhs. As well as the moderate magnitude, like 5.9, it causes 12,000 death also. And equally, we have a, a, the, the cost of damage also uh, in uh, most of the uh, you know uh, places. And uh, when you keep on uh, seeing these deaths, so keep on going in years, it started uh, decreasing somewhat. If you see in 1989, USA, this is seven magnitude earthquake, only death is 68, but the damage due to this uh, earthquake is somewhere around 66,000. So what it clearly says about all these earthquakes, which clear in years, uh, we have, uh, you know, uh, the last 500 deaths are there, uh, the the uh, impacts are there, uh, the damage due to these earthquakes are enormous. And one thing what I would observe is the compared to the, the developed countries and developing countries, the death toll is increased. Uh, but in developed countries, the death toll is uh, really uh, less number compared to the developing countries. So this is one thing. And second thing is whether the this locations of the earthquake epicenters, you know, play a major role. Whether these locations are really in a city area or or it may be in a uh, uh, the area where they don't have much, you know, uh, population. So. Uh, all these questions are there uh, again uh, the the damage everything is depending on the location of the epicenter and the and the energy which is released and the magnitude so all these things are important in case of an earthquake safety and uh, the second thing is like you know how quickly we are recovering back because you know uh, if you see uh, 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 the 2004 uh, earthquakes followed by the tsunami in india uh, in uh, 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 offshore so still, still, I could see whenever I cross over there near, there is a place in South, Southern India, Chadrangapatnam, Kadlur, all this, but still in many of the places, you know, still the people, they are not fully recovered out of 2000, almost uh, 16, 17 years over, but still, still uh, their lifestyle is not recovered fully. Uh, 
but what i could see from other countries like uh, japan and all uh, they are quickly recovering so if you see this kind of pictures this is uh, during 2011 japan uh, uh, earthquake followed by the tsunami so this is the during uh, this is uh, after sometimes like one month or two months after so these are all some of the pictures uh, i could show so they are very quickly recovering so if you see the the, the picture over there here it is in the sendai airport this is in march uh, 11th and uh, the right side if you see the other picture this is on april 13th within one month the whole washdevi sendai airport is uh, totally restored and uh, they started the flight service so such a way that you know they are quickly recovering so this is this this gives one you know quickly in my mind is so uh, the quick recovery uh, uh, make the any 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 uh, you know countries resilient to uh, disasters because the lessons what we learn out of this is like uh, the the preparedness is very very important uh, be prepared the preparedness and mitigation is bound more uh, 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 yield uh, effective returns than distributing relief after a disaster that's what our government of india we we work towards the proactive approach uh, on uh, uh, drr and the second thing is create a culture of preparedness and prevention because this two are again a major uh, you know concern in countries like india where we have huge population so uh, these two uh, uh, stuck in my mind actually so that's why uh, as chandan goswar rightly pointed out like you know uh, we in south india we we closely work uh, towards these aspects uh, particularly educating the people on uh, disaster education and uh, earthquake uh, i'm not again going into detail on uh, what is earthquake and other things but what i want to convey is something like you know uh, what we could do for our safety so uh, uh, other impacts of earthquakes you have a ground shaking you have a liquefaction liquefaction is nothing but when the uh, the soil get a zero stress uh, the compact soil will become solidified the the building will sunk and uh, we have a, a uh faulting so that you will have a relative movement because of that also building will damage and we have a land subsidence this is another impact on uh, earthquake so slowly you know the land will go down and uh, induce landslides earthquake can create landslides uh, it will induce uh, uh, landslides in hilly areas and of course you have a, if you have a earthquakes in uh, offshore we'll have a tsunami so the earthquake is not a only one phenomena only ground shaking it is going to create the cascade of effects so that's why earthquake is very very important so what we need to understand is uh, understand earthquakes properly that is very very important uh, so we need to understand the characteristics of earthquakes before you going to uh, you know uh, treat any disasters so you need to understand what it is so earthquake generally usually no warning over following a major earthquake secondary shocks may give warning for a further earthquakes so again uh, this concern again uh, I'll, i'll tell you an uh, example recently uh, we have a, a series of uh, you know uh, 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 shocks over here in in uh, velu district itself actually uh, it is not an earthquake actually uh, we felt uh, recently you might have seen in tv actually uh, uh my sc screen is shared uh, uh, sir you can uh, share again because uh, okay. it is not now okay wait 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 sir wait wait i think uh, i don't know why no uh, no it's it's okay sir yeah it's okay sir yeah so what happened so there are series of shocks which is so people were complaining that morning 6 o'clock morning 7 o'clock 8 o'clock continuously more than 10 to 15 times which has happened but uh, when we look into our uh, uh, raisak portal uh, there is no earthquake were recorded in this region but uh, keep on uh, you know uh, 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 shocks were observing actually we observed shocks over there and uh, even we have visited the area immediately uh, what we could see like you know we could see many diagonal cracks over there on the buildings so uh, uh, again uh, it's a typical phenomena over here like you know it is not an earthquake it is not a recorded over there it's just a ground shaking again uh, it's not even uh, felt by many people it's only felt locally in in a particular area maybe around 2 uh, uh, square kilometer by 2 square kilometer area so all these things 
or like you know in connect we have to put you know the in connection with earthquake as well as the the, the ground response what we feel so uh, these are all something like you know very peculiar in case of uh, uh, places like velur we have uh, uh, we are just in zone 3 uh, we can expect a magnitude of only 6.9 but the area again it may be a hard rock terrain but again we feel this kind of shocks frequently over here so these are all some kind of uh, you know uh, uh, things we have to fully undergo uh, a detailed study and um, the another thing in earthquakes is speed of onset is usually sudden that's why we are not able to uh, uh, predict earthquakes so far because uh, earthquake prediction is very very important unless you know uh, what magnitude earthquake is going to happen when and uh, where and uh, what is the coordinates and uh, what time it is going to happen we are not able to prepare for an earthquake so again uh, this is a big challenge what currently we have in all over the world uh, uh, that also another major concern what we are talking on and uh, earthquake prone areas generally well identified yeah we can divide the area we can assess the area and the major effects arise mainly from land movement fracture or slippage specifically they include damage usually very severe to structural systems plus there will be a considerable casualty due to lack of warning and uh, these are all some general countermeasures uh, what we can do for an earthquake so development of possible warning indicator uh, that's what like you know uh, dr chandan goshar also uh, usually uh, used to tell like you know uh, the, the the time travel uh, between p wave and s wave so uh, so if that could be able to predict we can able to have some kind of uh, two seconds or three seconds is kind of uh, you know warning can be given in a far place from the epicenter and uh, already these kind of practices are there in countries like japan for uh, bullet trains so similar kind of you know uh, uh, techniques can, uh, can be developed and the land use regulation building regulations uh, uh, what we can do re relocation of communities public awareness and education programs so these are all the things we can do for an earthquake and uh, we have a special problem areas uh, we have a severe and extensive damage creating need for an urgent countermeasures especially search and rescue so this is a major challenge what we currently face on earthquakes and uh, second thing is difficulty of access and movements so in case of an earthquake again the movement uh, the road movement will be uh, totally closed and we have a difficulty in access so we need to have a technology to identify these areas i'll show like you know some of the thing like what we have done uh, during nepal earthquake i'll show and the widespread damage of uh, loss of damage infrastructure essential services will fail so we have to go for a detailed analysis on that and uh, recovery of requirements restoration of buildings and uh, other things may be very costly so again we have a challenge on that and the rarity of occurrence again uh, 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 earthquake may happen in the bigger earthquake what i mean to say like in a higher magnitude earthquake which may happen in a place where 100 years or 200 years return period so this is the big challenge again what we have currently because whenever we go with any kind of uh, you know uh, plan to submit it to government government says like you know when the are you able to predict an earthquake if you say no so uh, earthquake return period may be 100 years or 200 years but uh, they don't want to really invest so much money on earthquake monitoring or earthquake uh, you know the other uh, kind of studies because it is going to happen in 100 years or 200 years only why you want to invest so much money so that is also another major concern what we are facing so uh, so uh, the reason days lot of new you know uh, innovative techniques and innovative lot of new uh, uh, techniques are available so uh, we have interpolate earthquakes and we have interpolate earthquakes so interpolate earthquakes people they used to uh, do with a lot of uh, gps monitoring and other things uh, but interpolate earthquakes uh, is the one uh, at least we can able to assess the area so nowadays people they started working on uh, how the interpolate earthquakes are moving and uh, where the stress energy got released so uh, accumulated and strain energy got released this can be uh, studied so these are all some of the precursors we can even identify from uh, uh, satellite data. So uh, this is one thing like cassetti fault mapping uh, by using aster images. 
so if you know the fault system so if you start monitoring this one the this vector fields are moving towards you can see the arrow marks so wherever you have the arrow marks jointly uh, you know you know connecting towards a particular area where assume that there will be a chances of accumulation of cysts again uh, we are not able to predict earthquake but at least we can have a kind of idea like you know in this location where there will be a high uh, stress is accumulating another one is sar interferometry uh, this also people uh, they started uh, many people they are working on um, here again uh, in x y z direction you can identify is there any subsidence is going to happen uh, uh, so that if you monitor continuously for a particular area where you have fault systems so uh, you can able to identify at least uh, how much you know uh, displacement is going to happen in that particular area and uh, radar signals also another uh, one like you know there will be a disturbance in uh, fault prone areas where you can identify some kind of uh, signatures and uh, this is cassetti fault mapping so before an earthquake like you know the heat energy will be generated in a particular area uh, so that uh, maybe particularly in area where we have a uh, uh, plate boundaries so this also another uh, technique uh, people they started using uh, where the accumulation of most heat energy in a particular area so that we can say this area can produce more earthquakes again it can produce earthquake it may be three or it may be two magnitude or it may be 10 magnitude, yeah. seven, seven magnitude or eight magnitude also so we do not know what magnitude earthquake is going to generate in a particular area but however we can have a little kind of precursor so we can have a idea like you know this location which area is highly prone to earthquakes and um, the next thing is like we are able to identify the areas but the thing is uh, uh, whatever we do is like you know on a ground level but uh, the building what we construct uh, which is safer for an earthquake this is a big question actually uh, because you know we have to educate uh, the particularly the builders uh, they do not know uh, what kind of uh, you know building will have a kind of uh, different damage for a different location because you know a uh, different kind of building will have a different structural elements so how it is going to happen whether small build, building will uh, uh, failure more or tall building will failure more so if you see the two examples the left hand side if you see this is a seven magnitude earthquake uh, 20 to 60 second uh, duration uh, there will be a violent ground shaking uh, if you have this kind of uh, you know uh, uh, scenario the wooden frame house might be uh, less damaged and the RCC old brick building will be totally collapsed. The skyscraper may be little cracks. But uh, uh, in the nine magnitude earthquake, the duration is one to five minutes. It's five times more uh, compared to this uh, uh, duration. Uh, in this earthquake, again, even though it is a moderate ground shaking, uh, the, 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 uh, the frequency is very, uh, you know, uh, low but uh, it's, a, it's a kind of uh, long duration so the damage will be like a wooden frame or old brick buildings or uh, uh, partial collapse but the skycraft will have a more traffic this is again uh, depending upon the residents of the building so this kind of thing should be taken care of when when people they go for uh, the earthquake uh, constructing earthquake resistant uh, structures in in a different area and um, what we currently do is like, you know, everybody knows about uh, we have a deterministic approach. We have a probabilistic approach based on that we can go for a seismic hazard assessment so that uh, in a deterministic approach, you can say like in a particular fault, how much maximum magnitude it can occur in future that we can identify. Suppose if we have a fault over there in here in South India, this may generate maybe six magnitude and there will be a, a you know a maximum magnitude calculation so six means you can have a 6.5 so that you can calculate the peak ground acceleration value and uh, this is one kind of assessment you can do the other one is probabilistic assessment so that you can identify in a particular fault so how many five magnitude earthquake in future how many six so kind of probabilistic analysis also you can do so this is a uh, one thing but what we don't have currently is like the fault rupture planning because we do hazard assessment we have our bmtpc atlas uh, you know, for earthquakes we have a seismic zonation map everything but uh, uh, what we don't have currently i, I think uh, we don't have this one currently because we have fault map but fault rupture planning so if a fault is crossing over in a city 
area so are we have really do we have this kind of setback recommendations uh, i don't think so we have such kind of uh, things over there in uh, in india because you know uh, even in small countries like philippines there is a west valley fault which is crossing over uh, the city of manila and uh, they have uh, this kind of information but uh, uh, yeah, the, the detailed uh, uh, large scale mapping uh, sorry small scale mappings are required for this kind of area large scale mappings are required for this kind of areas if any fault uh, the, the quaternary faults which is crossing over there in uh, uh, city area should have this kind of fault rupture planning so that uh, the, the important areas like educational institutions uh, uh, the the the, the institu uh, uh, factories and uh, the where where we have uh, uh, most populous areas so this should be studied thoroughly and uh, another thing is like you know uh, this kind of filled up soil so uh, uh, we do this uh, seismic hazard assessment everything is okay but what generally you know particularly i don't think so i don't know about uh, north india but in southern part of india uh, just like that you know any any structural engineer if you ask they just go for uh, there of indian standard course they'll take this peak ground acceleration value and they started uh, giving a max value in a building design construction but uh, what generally we we found like you know the filled up areas like you know the lake areas which is filled up they have constructed over building in these areas these areas have a site amplification so if you feel one time earthquake over there in a filled uh, normal uh, hard rock terrain uh, the same uh, building will have two to three times high site amplification compared to the normal uh, ground area so whether uh, or this builders they con uh, consider this site effects that's a big question because uh, many of them they are not going for you know soil test so when they go for soil test maybe they can able to identify but uh, mostly they are not going for the soil test but this is also another important thing we have to consider like places like delhi and all it is in a river alluvium so again these areas may have a more amplification so that is also another thing and even i used to uh, you know uh, see like you know the earthquake which is happening far away uh, from uh, you know 2001 gujarat earthquake we felt in chennai city actually the indonesia 2004 earthquake we felt in uh, some of the places in chennai wherever we have this kind of filled up soil we have felt very highly so uh, it's very far maybe 1000 kilometer away even 600 700 kilometer away from the place but still we have even though if you say like the peak ground acceleration and everything but uh, it will be reduced but the shaking is violent when if you compare the uh, the normal peak ground acceleration because of the site amplification and another thing is liquefaction so uh, uh, liquefaction, I I, I I talk about liquefaction because uh, when the soil gets zero stress, again uh, the the building will sink. Uh, this is also another major concern. Uh, I don't know how many of them they are doing uh, liquefaction studies in the uh, uh, liquefaction prone areas because we have uh, regionally uh, seismic hazard map is there. But uh, we don't have anything like, you know, liquefaction prone area map or uh, uh, if even though if they do consider soil amplification also, uh, some area they do soil test, but uh, whether they are considering this liquefaction uh, site effects in a particular area is a big question again. So when uh, liquefaction can be considered, this is also a big question because uh, many of them, they do not know what to do in case of a land use planning. Uh, if you are going to have a new construction like your smart cities and other things, so uh, they need to understand is there any speci specific soil character and high water table and uh, earthquake large enough to trigger liquefaction because what magnitude earthquake is going to trigger liquefaction? This is also a major concern. And uh, uh, geologically young soil, predominantly Holocene soil, less than 10,000 years old, loose soil, it is not compacted sediment that are prone to liquefaction. And pine grain and non cohesive uh, coarse silt and pine sand soil with a shallow water table, maybe around uh, less than 5 meter below the surface. So, these soils are uh, prone to liquefaction. And uh, if you have uh, what magnitude earthquake can trigger liquefaction, maybe uh, if you have more than 0.1 G, 
so it between like you know intensity 6 to 7 so if you have at least 6 magnitude earthquake uh, to generate so you can simplify right you know you have a seismic hazard map you know which are all the areas are prone to uh, more than 6 magnitude it means zone 3 zone 4 and zone 5 because zone 2 is 4.9 magnitude maximum 4.9 magnitude you can expect uh, in zone uh, 3 4 5 so liquefaction may be possible so because you are going to have a more than 6.9 magnitude is going to happen in zone 3 uh, zone 4 is 7.9 and uh, zone 5 is 8 and above so these areas can be uh, should have a concern on liquefaction studies so what you can do when the liquefaction should be considered so what kind of land use are the soils are susceptible to liquefaction if no then go for no planning action but if there is yes then or the consequence of liquefaction is significant. So, what is the likelihood of an earthquake producing 0.1 g in the greater? Because what is the maximum magnitude which is going to happen in that particular site? Suppose if you are going for a tall building because uh, the the g plus one or g plus two story building may not much you know impact uh, by the liquefaction. But if you have a tall building compared to g plus one or two building, the tall building will sunk compared to G plus one or two building, depending upon the liquefaction proneness of that particular soil. Again, this is vice versa in case of a ground shake. So the G plus one will have more shaking compared to the uh, uh, tall building in case of a shaking. But in case of a liquefaction prone, the tall building will sum, the G plus one will survive. So again, uh, depending upon the location, everything will vary. So you need to have a detailed study on that. So, if the area is prone to PGA 0.1 G or greater, then you have to go for a liquefaction risk study. Then what is the potential <coughs> planning of action in that area? So, what is the existing development? So, what kind of uh, further development can be restricted? All this thing because uh, avoid, uh, you know, tall buildings in that particular area, avoid any, you know, educational institutions, uh, the critical facilities, all these things we can go for. Uh, so, so that we can have a risk based approach. And uh, I think another uh, five, 10 minutes I'll uh, complete. So another one is like, you know, uh, rapid visual screening of buildings. This is also important uh, because, you know, every time we are not able to go and do non-destructive testing in an area because it's costly. And uh, if you have a number of building in areas like in a major cities, uh, maybe an educational institution, like, you know, building places like where we have uh, VIT and all, we have densely populated area. So we have number of high risk buildings over here. So we can go for this kind of rapid visual screening techniques. So which is available ready-madely. There are the forms are available. Uh, the guidelines are given by NDMA already. And uh, so we have a uh, 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 different forms for different zone, zone three, zone four, and zone five. So we'll anybody can do this exercise. Actually, uh, you can identify the areas uh, by just uh, digitizing the. Uh, uh footprint map of the area and do some kind of analysis and give a score value if your building is having more than uh, 0.7 uh, score value your building will be safe and if it is less than 0.7 then your building should have a further evaluation for an earthquake situation so uh this kind of like you know maps you can generate uh, like you know i have done it for uh, our uh, chennai city part of the chennai city we have done uh, some kind of uh, maps like this because whenever we go to any government like you know they are not ready to spend so much of money on particular you know study uh, so if you want to do entity study for whole area this area is more than 5000 6000 buildings are there it's very costly even though it, the, the places in zone 3 but all buildings are not you know uh, prone to earthquake so if you do this kind of exercise at least uh, so out of this 5000 building only uh, 7 to 8 percent of the building only uh, uh, prone to uh, earthquake and uh, they need further you know uh, uh, evaluation is recommended so uh, you can save a lot of money on doing this kind of exercises and uh, this is what we do uh, 0.7 means the high probability of grade 4 damage and very high probability of grade 3 damage like like that you can find it out and uh, the only those areas we can go for NDT and these are all seismic building codes already available for existing building for new building uh, this is existing building so all these things like you can go for earthquake safety and uh, again uh, this also i want to highlight actually this is the slide uh, by professor a s arya 
So wherever I go and present on anything on earthquake, I used to uh, give. So now earthquake resistant design is very much possible. So that uh, if it is a Masonic construction, if it is on zone three, only two percent of your total cost, and if it is a RCC building, maximum three point three point two percent of your total cost. So these are all you know you can concentrate in case of an earthquake safety. But however, uh, earthquake is not predictable, right? So which is beyond our control. What we can do, we can go for scenario analysis. So uh, uh, in case of an earthquake, if there is going to be a higher magnitude earthquake. How these facilities are damaged because these, if during uh, an earthquake situation, the critical facilities and lifeline facilities, if these facilities are damaged, so still we have a problem. We are not able to do anything because hospital, medical clinic, schools, all these places are important places. We, so we have to identify, uh, we have to do the vulnerability assessment for these areas. And uh, uh, for scenario, actually, because we do not know what magnitude earthquake is going to happen. Actually, I have shown some, you know, uh, picture over there, like uh, this area we have studied uh, RBS, rapid visual screen. But uh, just for uh, maximum magnitude, we considered for six. But if seven magnitude happen in future, we do not know. Because earlier we used to say India is prone to, uh, many area of India is not prone to earthquake. Zone one was there. Now there is no zone one. We have now only zone two. So those kind of uh, changes are there frequently nowadays. So what uh, we need to have, like we need to have a scenario. If there is a different kind of scenario, six magnitude, seven magnitude, how the building will have a damage, different damage. See, even we can find it out uh, uh, by uh, by this kind of methods in uh, JS. So you can identify uh, when uh, the schools can reopen, which are all the facilities will damage during the earthquake. So everything you can calculate. And another thing is quick response. In any any uh, you know disaster situation, quick response is very very important. Um, actually, we have used some kind of uh, you know uh, 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 Facebook knowledge, the social media, and other thing. Uh, when uh, 2026 April 2015 Nepal earthquake happened, so we have used this uh, uh, simple technique. Like you know, uh, these are all some of the images you may going to see. Yeah, so we get uh, data from satellite data. Uh, actually, those days, like, you know, uh, we have to get a satellite, a raw satellite data. It's a real-time satellite data from InnoSat, you know, UN operating satellite system. When there is an earthquake happen, you can trigger the source. But nowadays, like, you can get the data from uh, International Disaster Charter. But earlier, we used to get data from InnoSat. So InnoSat can provide the high-resolution satellite image. From that, you have to do the image analysis. And we have a crisis mapper group in Google, actually, uh, Google groups. We have a people group of people. We work together like, you know, 24 by 7. Uh, if any disaster happened, uh, particularly uh, earlier days, we used to work on earthquakes. So we get the data from, uh, uh, you know, set, uh, you know, set uh, they provide the DigiGlobe maps, uh, DigiGlobe real time satellite data that we will uh, do the image analysis will uh, uh, spread this information through our social media with the local NGOs there and we will identify the high uh, impact areas and they can go and do the uh, uh, rescue operation. So this is what we have done like you know you can see this pictures uh, this is called a rapid damage mapping which are all the areas which is highly damaged during an earthquake and the right side if you see this one is the violet color red color buildings the violet color buildings are total collapse. The red color so you can see in the right hand side these are all the scenes like you know every one hour uh that time the uh, digi globe has sh shared their one hour real time satellite high resolution satellite data so uh, if you click over there and you can find it out this kind of high resolution. yeah so th all this information you can find it out and uh even you can identify it. and uh, uh another five minutes i'll finish it up uh so uh what uh, uh, the important of disaster management plan actually in VIT we have a disaster management plan. So kind of uh, detailed information we have. So uh, this evacuation plan also we have. So this is called VIT University Emergency Management Plan. So here if you see the version because every year we revise this plan because the emergency numbers will change again the hazard may change we have a Three currently what we have a fire laboratory as and earthquakes and how we have to be prepared for that and all the contact informations are available over here and we have a very detailed plan also with this area like you know we have a resource mapping everything we have 
So I'll just show like, you know, how we prepare ourselves uh, for uh, our institute. So we do mock exercises, uh, drill and demo, tabletop exercises, functional exercises and full scale tests we used to conduct in our university. You see this one that we call NDRF from Arakonam. Actually, this is there here uh, nearby us and uh, we invite people to do mock exercises within our campus because our campus we have uh, more than uh, 20, 25 high rise buildings and we have more than 35,000 students in our campus. That's why our students, you know, safety is important. So we want to be resilient to disaster. So we trained our students and other stakeholders during this meeting. So we call everyone. So like, you know, this is our chancellor. So in, including from chancellor to our uh, lab attender, student, everybody will attend this kind of uh, mock exercises over here. So we call uh, NDRA people to display their equipment, what they have. And uh, yeah. So participate. I request so these are all the equipments which is uh, brought by NDRF. So we display everything first initially. So these are all our lab attenders. So everybody will involve in this kind of uh, you know uh, uh, event. So these are all our students and the local people like the nearby village people also we invite and they all see like what is going on here and uh, they discuss. Then after that we have a briefing with our you know stakeholders, our uh, registrar our estate office, our, uh, you know, security personnel, our students and uh, NDRF personnel, news reporters, our faculties, our students. So everybody will be there so that, you know, uh, the uh, main idea is to everybody know uh, what is happening. Uh, so this is what we do. Then after that, we'll give the hands-on exercise. Uh, we conduct some kind of basic life support system training to them uh, by NDRF people and how to handle the victims and how to ship the patient, how to put in stretcher. So everything we treat them. So all those things, uh, tabletop exercise, we discuss with in the uh, uh, room and we'll have a verbal scenario. And after that, uh, we'll have a, a scripted scenario and a full scale test. We conduct this one over there in uh, our one of the hostel building. You can see we develop incident response system. You can see in the back actually incident response system Commandants are there. All these people are our uh, NDRA people and myself. We we brought all students, lab, but everybody will attend. Okay, you can see like thousands of people who are standing over here and uh, uh, they announce, they card in the area. It's like a real time situation. Uh, they go and uh, they mark the area and uh, <clears throat> they identified some of the students. They got stuck, like, you know, we created a scenario an earthquake scenario, some student, they got stuck over there in the top of the building. So they cut the uh, window and they brought the student by rope rescuing. And this is what they do. And uh, as we, we, we created a scenario like our main door is closed. So they don't have a places to, you know, uh, go and rescue. So what they do, they cut the wall and they will rescue the people. That's what they put a triangle kind of things and uh, they put a hole over there then they have a 360 degree camera they put is there any victim in the other side they have find it out they rescue the people they cut the window uh, the, the door by track and uh, this what rope rescue simultaneously they so our students they act as a victim and uh, they brought uh, other uh, you know victims also which we who got affected by the earthquake uh, these are all scenarios we have generated like uh, and uh, some people may get stuck over there near uh, under the slab of a concrete debris. So they how to rescue these people. They demo 45 degree angle and uh, uh, snatch out. And uh, these are all some of the things. And uh, uh, the good thing is like, you know, uh, we involve everyone. This is our chancellor's son, uh, vice president of our university. He also involved our estate office, our public relation office, our students. So everybody will involve in this kind of situation and uh, uh, we brought media. Uh, so uh, we make aware people, every one of the people in this area to, to do that. And uh, last two minutes, I'll finish it up this one. Uh, the one important thing what I want to convey is we have our own traditional and indigenous knowledge that we are not using much uh, that our indigenous and 
disaster uh, traditional knowledge if we use then we can uh, with our new technology so that we can uh, save more number of people and will be resilient to disasters like this are the, some of the example earthquake resistant uh, uh, traditional architecture in japan actually uh, this is somewhere in 1300 years old temple uh, many earthquakes were hit over the here but uh, none of the earthquake uh, damaged the temple uh, so such a way that they have constructed the temple this kind of structures were there in india in those days but uh, now we don't have this kind of structures uh, it was uh, given in this uh, you know uh, 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 literature stating that this Japanese architect who came to India who learned this technique and he go back to Japan and introduce this technique but in a, we don't have this kind of technique over there in South India now uh, India now and uh, this is another thing like you know a bubble tree so this is a clear indication of how the uh, the area is undergoing drought so uh, the the uh, bottom to stop it started drying uh, there is a drought uh, when uh, rainfall failed, so this is a clear indication of drought area. And this Emelaka bird, actually, this birds, uh, they will shift their nest before a flood situation. So all these things are uh, and Vaju protection for uh, this thing and Mangra protection for tsunami protection. And this is uh, one more important thing, like you know, for flood warning in our uh, you know Tamil Nadu, we have this kind of thing. In olden days, our kings were constructed like a kind of structure inside the river. So there'll be a conch over there. Then when water comes uh, in the river, when it is crossing its limits, so uh, the conch will give a sound because it's automatic early warning system. Uh, the wind will come hit over there via this, uh, you know, conch. So when wind goes inside the conch, then the other side will have a sound. So uh, when water increases, automatically this will come. So people will go out of this, you know, riverbank area. Once the sound is reduced, then they will come back. So our forefathers, our kings are very, very clever. So they 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 install this kind of uh, early warning system in those days itself in uh, in uh, uh, many of the river areas. And uh, this is another place, my native place actually. Uh, uh, this area is prone to a highly drought area. So they constructed a pond over there and they collect all water over from uh, nearby streams and put it over here. And uh, if you go on uh, all 365 days in a year, you will get a water and there is a structure where uh, they, they, those days the kings, they stored food. So in case of a drought, you need a food and water. They, they make it available for the village people over this. And another one like similar kind of structure they have in the top of the hill and they also have a kind of pond over there in the uh, top of the building, uh, top of the fort. So that when the, this bottom area got flooded, then this top area, they are using this food and water. So how our you know kings are very clever in those days. Also, they have a surveillance system over there in three forts. This is a uh, three forts are there. You can go and see like you know nowadays we use uh, in GIS and uh, remote sensing. Say like you know optimum site analysis for our you know uh, telephone towers and other things. Like you know they have a, a kind of structure over there in the one hill. From that hill there is a small hole. You can see from this hole to other two you know uh, forts where uh, the king, you can see the king and queen from one place. So the surveillance, they have those days. Still it is there, you can visit this place and see. And uh, this kind of temple architecture they use for incident command system. And uh, they do a lot of drainage management also. And uh, these kind of structures, uh, you know, temple structures over there in the uh, coastal area. So there were conflicts over these kind of temples because uh, these temples are in a structure like, you know, aerodynamic. So wind will come, it will lead to... So a lot of information our forefathers, they have given to us. Uh, these kind of, uh, you know, informations can be linked with the technology. And this is another place, Kalani Dam. This is a thousand years old dam, which is constructed over a liquefaction prone soil. So you can go and see even this dam is thousand years old. No single crack were there in this dam. So our forefathers are quite, uh, you know, intelligent. Uh, 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 our Indians are very, very knowledgeable. So <clears throat> our traditional and indigenous knowledge are very high. If we combine together our indigenous knowledge uh, with our new technology, so we will have our you know uh, uh, resilience India. So our destination is disaster rescue India. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much, sir, uh, for such an insightful and uh, very uh, informative lecture.
by covering uh, earthquake resilience, conceptual aspects of that, and monitoring then special focus areas, and particularly at the end part that is drawing inspiration from our ancient technology and putting them into the modern perspective. Thank you so much, sir. So we have some questions for you. Uh, the first question is, sir, why don't we include disaster management in schools? Uh, yeah, already I think uh, we have a syllabus in uh, uh, CBSE, disaster management, and slowly they started including in geography, part of geography also they already included, and uh, universities already it is there. Uh, for your kind information, we have a, a university elective in our university. Now it is like environmental science, disaster management also it's mandatory in all educational, all engineering colleges and uh, uh, universities. So we have a, for your kind of information, uh, we have a university elective every semester, minimum 500 students, they opt for this subject. So it's a university elective, anybody can opt for this subject. So we, we earlier we used to float one or two, you know, slots, but now we are able to, uh, you know, uh, float some 10 to 15 slots over there. Even sometimes we have 1000 students, 1200 students, they have this one subject in one semester. Thank you so much, sir. So another question is uh, similar to this, like why can't we teach school children and nurture the culture of disaster management? Yes, this is also very, very important because if you go and teach uh, in educational institutions like schools, particularly, uh, it will reach very quickly because if you teach one uh, one children in a school, then immediately the children will go and uh, disseminate this information to the parents. So one become three and the parents will disseminate, OK, my daughter or my son, uh, she talk about disaster. So to the neighbors. So. This was the initial, you know, thing like, you know, we also do a lot of uh, this kind of activities over here in Vellur and surroundings. Uh, we used to have uh, uh, nearby schools, we give a lot of mock drills, trainings for those school children. For your kind information, uh, uh, there is a school uh, nearby. I'm the consultant for the school, uh, disaster management consultant. They have a disaster management committee at the school level and the children's from 5th standard to 10th uh, standard, they are there. So every year, uh, two mock drills we used to conduct for the school. Also, the drill was conducted initially by us. And later on, every year, the student itself, they are conducting drills over there. And also, all the teachers are trained over there. And they have a disaster management plan for the school. Uh, that is the first school full-fledged disaster management plan in Vellu district. And they have a detailed disaster management plan, floor-wise plan, everything with all uh, emergency exit, everything they have. And also, for your kind information, the uh, students are sustainable. For example, we teach from 5th to 10th. So what we do always is like we ask the 10th students to teach the same thing to the 9th student. So that when the 9th student get go to 10th student, once he get passed, it will be like, you know, continued. It won't be stopped. So this is what we are doing for last four or five years. So we are doing this actually. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Another question is on uh, flood. Bihar gets flooded every year. What steps can we take to avoid that? Uh, yeah. See, uh, uh, floods, uh, particularly flood prone uh, 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 structures are there. The main thing in Bihar is a different case actually, the river meandering. Because you can't see the Kosi River, for example, Kosi River. You can't see the river in uh, to, this year it will be here and next year it will get moved to next place. That is the major challenge what we have currently in Bihar. So a lot of flood mitigation measures they are doing, but still, still it's a nature. Actually, uh, uh, every time, you know, uh, we are not able to fully control our nature. And uh, we are trying because we mostly disturbed our nature, actually. Already we... That area got disturbed so much by other activities. So these kind of areas can be, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, apply because, you know, holistically we have to see. Whenever we do any kind of structural or non-structural mitigation measures in any of the areas, we are not seeing the problem holistically. That's what Dr. Bandaria sir has always uh, suggest. Uh, say example, if there is a landslide area, we, can, we just see if there is a landslide means only that slope only we will see. But what happened in that particular slope in the top, 
what what is going to happen in the particular slope at the bottom so where is the weight is coming where is the force is coming so these kind of information we don't much see what generally we do if you want to do a mitigation measures in a road cut we immediately will go we'll construct a gabion wall we'll construct a breast wall and uh, we close the intersection but what happened what this a uh, gabion wall is going to give additional weight for that particular location maybe it can lead to another you know landslide so what we need to do places like bihar is we need to have a holistic approach so unless you have a holistic approach it is not possible to uh, mitigate those kind of disasters thank you sir so next question is on earthquake so does earthquake come at only tectonic plate uh yeah actually it's not uh, only tectonic plate uh, that's what uh, uh, we have a uh, different kinds of earthquakes one is uh, continental uh, continental collision like you know we have a uh, divergent boundary we have a submergent boundary a convergent boundary so in those boundaries we have earthquakes and uh, the areas where we have sir you are muted kindly unmute sir i think somebody has muted so wherever we have this weaker zones so are nothing but the faults and other you know areas so tectonic plate is one thing other one is fault planes so wherever we have the faults so there we have a time to time reactivation because of that also we we'll have earthquakes and other quakes are there even moon quakes are there that is not due to uh, tectonic plate that also it is there thank you sir so last question is how can we as college students be part of disaster management process what opportunities can we take benefit of and contribute in the disaster management processes in the country yeah so it's a very good question actually we welcome more more like people like you because i i told about like uh, when 2015 nepal earthquake happens we need hands actually even we have a facebook page called uh, the new face society of uh, tamil nadu actually so we involve people so wherever i go and teach these people details i used to collect and uh, we have a group of people you don't believe like you know we have more than 10000 to 15000 volunteers are there in a facebook group actually so we used to put our information in that whenever we need any kind of help like including blood or any disaster related thing for example recently you might have heard in tamil nadu we had a a big rally for uh, uh, to have a uh, this bullock uh, this thing so uh, those days like you know uh, our volunteers they really help even chennai flood kerala flood so all these times our uh, students are there to help uh, that's what like you know our students if you train student in a proper manner uh, they'll be ready to work and uh, uh, you can involve in normally in uh, uh, uh voluntarily and government process also like you know whenever we do like a lot of mock drills and other things we used to call students and they used to participate like you know how to handle the situation uh, what are the different kinds of you know rescue methods are available or we teach then we used to involve the students actually because we have to train the unless we train for example triage triage is an important thing in particularly in mass casualty incidents so only a doctor can do triage generally but if you train more number of students if you have a mass casualty incidents like you know gujarat that thousands of people they get impacted uh, affected so that time if you know how to triage involve students so students can go and do this triage operation easily so we can uh, very much use students you are most welcome uh, maybe uh, 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 you can share my details to uh, any of the students if they are interested you are most welcome just uh, type in facebook ganapati patkandan you can get uh, my link so all uh, students related thing i used to post in facebook so you are most welcome sure sir sure sir thank you so much sir uh, for your uh, enlightening words and uh, showing the words of wisdom to all of us so uh, shreyas uh, can you can you share uh, this thank you now? can i intervene uh, yes yes ma'am yes professor ganpati i am really uh, very thankful for this informative presentation you have almost touched upon each and every point which we actually wanted to discuss in this 3 days training program and i got excited about the university dm plan which you spoke about and it is a need of an art and yesterday also we were discussing about that there is a need to develop a dm plan for a university especially like a case in delhi 
having Delhi University or a, therefore more ca main campuses are there, North Campus, South Campus and all. And these have become like educational hub. So they have the colleges and they are so much supporting small institutions which are cropping around. And the area has become a kind of educational hub sort of place where you have so many young population at one certain point of time and they all are the resources, the future resource of the nation and the current main resource of the nation. The educational fraternity is there. The, uh, the infrastructure resource is there. So it becomes extremely important to have that kind of, you know, overall university plan. And your, uh, I mean, just mentioning that you have a university DM plan, it gave me so much of confidence and I really look towards you to learn more on that how we can prepare this university DM plan in case of Delhi, especially uh, uh, any of the college if it takes the lead because this kind of model exercise can definitely help uh, the institutions in a longer way. And uh, of course, as you mentioned also that we need to prepare a DM plan, which is more comprehensive. It's just not talk about an evacuation plan, but it should also support pre-disaster mitigation, the building type, the infrastructure structure quality. We have bad infrastructure as well as good infrastructure. So the, as you mentioned, RVS, so should it be the part of the uh, of the of such kind of plan that what kind of buildings are there? For example, uh, in college buildings, few buildings are like heritage buildings, old buildings which are running. Uh, I mean, the, since the Britishers' time, and uh, uh, what is the quality of their building now? It has been deteriorating. Are uh, are they are still in the same way, or we need to check their quality? Do we need to take, I mean, such initiatives now as we have seen so much in the last two years and any such big event, Delhi being in zone four, could cause, I mean, a tremendous impact on the country overall. So, uh, and of course, I'm also talking about the informal sector uh, and the coaching centers and the play, play groups and the schools, so many institutions which are building around. So how to address those issues? It becomes really a challenge. So thank you very much, sir. Your presentation was remarkable. And I really want if you could join us tomorrow uh, for a small discussion we have kept, especially for drawing up a framework of disaster institutional uh, building or a framework for a university DM plan. So maybe 10 minutes of yours would be sufficient for us to little, sure, get a little sure. bit more on the processes which could be followed for making such kind of university plans. Actually, whatever I present today on our, uh, I'm not much focused on because others going to talk. That's why I'm not uh, much focused today on educational this thing, because we have uh, separate guidelines for those okay. things. So including uh, uh, individual uh, uh, pre-disaster plan and post-disaster and during both, all, all three we have. And also we even, we even we have a guidelines to I have a you know a plan for uh, including students who was who's going for field visits uh, or industrial visits so that okay. also we have a separate uh, guidelines and uh, safety measures so everything we have and uh, apart from that uh, individual buildings level uh, safety measures uh, in connection with disasters that also we have actually uh, resource Sir, mapping are available on the websites also no ma'am this is not on the website but uh, some of the things i can share uh, because we have uh, uh, good documents so i will share okay. i will share uh, you can just send your email so that i can share sure sir sure. you can take my number you. from uh, dr punam uh, sharma and uh, i can sure. share my details and uh, if you want like you know we will discuss something and we can definitely have a kind of separate webinar i think someday when number you are free to discuss these issues, sir, actually, I feel that this becomes a very essential issue. No, sir, so we, we used to conduct so many programs, particularly for students, uh, disaster management related programs. So a lot of information are there and uh, we can discuss, ma'am. No problem. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Sir. Absolutely. Uh, Dr. Garima, I completely agree with you. Uh, uh, Dr. Kanapati, we would be definitely, um, I would you know, having a separate session on the disaster management plans on different ways with you uh, soon, maybe uh, uh, maybe in the next month or so, because this is really very, very essential.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, Shreyas, uh, can you share the screen? So, sir, uh, team uh, NIDM and CDMS, uh, Shahid Bhagat Singh College, proudly present a uh, certificate of appreciation to you as a token of respect and gratitude. So, kindly accept, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. So we have uh, entered into the second leg of uh, this uh, day two program. And uh, the session is on uh, risk assessment and mapping of vulnerable areas for preparation of DM plans. So speaker for this session is our own Professor Kavita Aroda, ma'am. Professor Kavita Aroda is presently working as professor at Department of Geography, Shahid Bhagat Singh College, University of Delhi. She is the member advisory board of Center for Disaster Management Studies, Sahid Bhagat Singh College, University of Delhi. She earns her PhD from Political Geography Division of Center for International Politics and Disarmament Study, School of International Study, Jawaharlal Nehru, University, New Delhi. She published her research in many national and international journals. Her area of interest are institutional response in disaster management, non-traditional security issues, transboundary cooperation in disaster management and environmental conservation, development and environment related issues in South and Southeast Asia. She has authored a book on indigenous forest management in Andaman and Nicobar Island, India Springer, and co-authored a book on urban green space, health economies and air pollution in India, Rotledge publication. So we are really uh, delighted to have you, ma'am. Uh, over to you, ma'am. Ma'am, uh, you are unmuted. Uh, like, uh, kindly unmute yourself, ma'am. You are muted, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ganesh, for a very nice introduction. First of all, I want to say thanks to Professor Ganpati. It was a very, very, indeed, very interesting presentation he gave. And I really touched with few places because we, a geographer, are really interested to go those those uh, fieldwork and places. You were showing the Jinji Fort and those places were really interesting. And it's uh, also interesting to know that how the people earlier also used to uh, prepare these disaster management uh, things. Uh, so thank you so much, sir. Uh, uh, hope you are able to see my slides. Uh, Ma'am, uh, you can share it. Uh, there's a symbol for that. You can go so and... Your screen is visible. You can yeah, share it's it. not sharing. Screen is visible, ma'am. I don't know what she, she needs to run the presentation. No? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, just I have to run. Uh, yes. Can you now? Ma'am, uh, in the last, in the right corner, you have uh, there the maximization and minimization bar. There is one monitor type of symbol in the uh, down right corner. Down right corner, man. Yes, yes, ma'am. In the down and uh, down, go down, and there is a in the right corner. If you press F5 on PPT, it will start uh, running. I don't know. I am not able to do. In fact, uh, this is something. You have to manually change the. Yeah, I yes. can do that. Yes. Okay, okay, no issue, ma'am. This is fine. Uh, can you able to see that? I just want. Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma okay, okay. So basically, uh, uh, I'm really can you make a slide mode, slideshow mode. Yes, yes. Go to the slideshow mode. Yes. No, I can manually do that. So since I can speak uh, according to that also, 
Right. Uh, so basically, uh, this topic is uh, given by CDMS and NIDM. Uh, this is risk assessment and mapping of vulnerable areas for protection of disaster management plan. Basically, the topic is uh, risk and the vulnerability has a very specific uh, aspect because uh, the different hazard have different kind of risk and also different kind of vulnerability uh, created by them. And there are a number of things which influence the risk and vulnerability. But since we are talking commonly about these aspects, I just took uh, a common uh, notion about these aspects, how we can uh, understand these concepts and generally in every where, in every situation, uh, we can uh, con uh, take some notion about that. What is the risk and how we can assess the risk? Uh, the location may be the flood prone area, the location may be the um, drought prone area, the location may be the uh, earthquake prone area. So how we can uh, think about this concept, what is the risk and what, how we can assess and what is the vulnerability. So uh, generally one thing uh, is about that, if you fail to prepare, you prepare to fail. So these two concepts are really need to understand by anyone because now disaster is the preparation, of, uh, require the preparation for any uh, one, any person anywhere can face any disaster. So these concepts in relation to that are really, really uh, very important. And uh, this is uh, also talk about by the UN, the Sendai framework is there. The Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction 2015-2013 outlined even clear target and four priorities for action to prevent new and reduce existing disaster risk. One is that understanding disaster risk, which we actually require to understand because what the concept is there, we generally use these terms, but uh, what are the characteristics of these things? Then strengthening disaster risk governance to manage disaster risk. Then investing in disaster reduction for resilience and enhancing disaster preparedness for effective response and build back better in recovery, rehabilitation and reconstruction. So first at all, I'm talking about the concept of risk. Risk include two elements, the likelihood of something happening and the consequences if it happened. Risks occur when factor and processes are sufficiently measurable for believable probability distribution to be assigned to the range of possible outcome. So these two uh, elements are really, really very important to understand. The risk, there are many definitions. So risk is a technical concept which is used by generally engineering and management specialists uh, initially, but right now it's also a very important concept uh, in disaster management area. To arrive at an estimation of losses in the event of a disaster and the expected probability of its occurrence. Risk is precisely defined by the ISDR at the probability of harmful consequences of expected losses, death, injuries, property, livelihood, economic activity, disrupted or environmental damage resulting from interaction between natural or human induced hazard. Concept of risk, vulnerability known as, uh, there are few concepts which we generally, uh, general population use. Uh, vulnerability, I'm again talking about in detail in later slides, uh, but just giving the difference between these aspects. So vulnerability known as the weakness of a system and threat is a similar kind of a concept, new discovered incident with the potential to do harm to system. Uh, this can be natural, unintentional or in intentional. Risk are potential losses on exploiting vulnerability by threat. Risk is the product of threat and vulnerability. So generally we have these uh, definitional concept. Risk is equal to hazard, probability into exposure into vulnerability. And then we can uh, assess the likelihood of losses. There are four types of risk. Acceptable risk or tolerable risk is therefore an important subterm. The extent to which a disaster risk is deemed acceptable or tolerable depends on existing social, economic, political, cultural, technical, and environmental conditions. 
In engineering term, acceptable risk is also used to assess and define the structural and non-structural measures that are needed in order to reduce possible harm to people, property, services, and system to a chosen tolerated level. According to courts or acceptance, accepted practice, which are based on known probability of hazards and other factors. There are few residual risk is the disaster risk that remains even when effective disaster risk reduction measures are in place and for which emergency response and recovery capacities must be maintained. The presence of residual risk implies a continuing need to develop and support effective capacity for emerging services, preparedness, response and recovery. Together with socioeconomic politics such as safety nets and risk transfer mechanism as part of a holistic approach. Uh, then national disaster risk, intensive and extensive disaster risk that either have a potential cumulative impact that is significant and relevant for the nation as a whole and or require national DRM coordination. Annotation, the boundaries of national disaster risk depend on the purpose and a scoping of a NDRA process. This has to be defined in each country, taking into account existing governance and DRM policies. National disaster risk at least include all risks that cannot be sufficiently managed at sub-national level. So overall, jo, uh, assessment hai, that can come under this uh, category. Extensive disaster risks are the risk associated with low severity, high frequency events, mainly but not ex exclusively associated with highly localized hazard. Intensive disaster risks are the risk associated with high severity, mid or low frequency events, mainly associated with major hazards. The risks are so systematic and cumulative. The general characteristics of risk are, they are forward looking. Generally, uh, we cannot see the risk, whatever happened. We generally assess the risks what would be happening? What can be happening? So these are the forward-looking concepts. Then these are very dynamic concepts. They always change. They can be at a time low. They can be higher. It depends on various factors. They are invisible. We cannot see the risk. We can assess the past consequences, but these are the invisible phenomena. Then these are unevenly distributed. It's not a single uh, uh, simple phenomena that uh, the, every place has the equally uh, distributed risk. Some are have higher risk, some have lower risk. They are emerge. They are suddenly become high. They are suddenly become low. And this is a very complex concept. So uh, generally when we uh, start assessing, then we understand there are so many factors which actually need to understand. Risk management involve minimizing the vulnerability so as to reduce the input of the threat. Risk is a matter of precise quantification. Risk may be expressed in terms of average expected losses from a given hazard to a given element at risk over a specified future time period. However, precise quantification is also very difficult, but there are many models and methods are available which are trying to do the quantification of the risk. Risk management has two components, risk assessment and risk evaluation. Risk assessment is understood as the methodology to determine the nature and extent of risk by analyzing potential hazard and evaluating existing condition of vulnerability that could pose a potential threat or harm to people, property, livelihood, and the environment on which they depend. Assessing the risk, uh, the risk generally, like if uh, we are working in a college and we need to assessing, uh, assess the risk of uh, our institution or our institutional uh, nearest area, then these are the general uh, aspect which we need to look at. Land use, land cover, what is the land use and what is land cover, hazard probability. There are lots of methods to understand and assess the hazard probability, timeline, uh, then there are mapping also there, so we can understand that exposure, how much risk uh, can occur, what are the exposure to the, uh, the future hazard of that particular institute or locality, vulnerabilities, how much that area is vulnerable, 
for it that particular uh, any particular hazard critical information for insurance uh, if there is because it's a very new uh, area uh, disaster insurance uh, not very much in the market but this information is very important to understand the risk construction so constructions are there are lots of type of construction generally we say ki how much uh, as sir was professor ganpati was also saying the earthquake resilience buildings are there then flood resilience buildings are there so how the that construction is built in that particular area then community capacity and capacity is actually has lots of things this can be uh, their coping capacity this can be the availability of resources what they can use uh, to mitigate the hazard so there are lots of things happen uh, are there involved in that so generally if you want to assess the risk so these things are really important to take in care then risk evaluation risk evaluation entail assessment of proposed risk reduction measures from the point of view of cost efficiency efficiency is examined by means of cost benefit procured or expected to be procured from a measure against cost likely to be incurred so risk evaluation is very very important thing because uh, this has cost and benefit thing and when uh, uh, when the governments also started looking at that ki uh, this much of disaster has are happening and this much of risk is there and this much of economic losses are happening so they also started focusing on ki how they can prevent the hazard and the, they, then they uh, started focusing on the more on the disaster management areas risk perception is another important aspect which need to understand in the context of risk that is uh, awareness of risk which is different in different countries and societies uh, because as sir was given the example of japan if you will look at the japan each and every day they face the disaster but they are managing very well uh, the look at the other countries uh nigeria or brazil recently there was landslide and the, they were not able to manage properly that thing so there are different perception awareness level management level are there uh, regarding the risk risk and vulnerability inter interface since i'm talking about these two very very important concept about the uh, disaster management field so we have to look at the what are the interface uh, be between these two concepts the concept originated from the social science in response to the pure hazard oriented perception of disaster risk in the 1970s since that time different discipline have developed their own concept uh, technocratic or behavioral paradigm i can say one uh, many thinkers talk about that the first approach to risk were the ones that assimilated it to hazard focused mainly on it carried out especially by professionals of the natural science geologists engineers metrologist according to black et al until the emergence of the idea of vulnerability to explain disaster there was a range of prevailing views none of which really dealt with the issue of how society create the conditions in which people face hazard differently the first approach was unapologetically unapolog naturalist in which all blame was uh, apportioned to the violent forces of nature government and individuals relied upon physical protection against the hazard in fact in our geography uh, field of geography also uh, generally whenever uh, we used to study the disaster we used to study the natural aspect natural hazards so that general understanding was that uh, disasters are the natural phenomena and we cannot do anything about that then physical vulnerability or structural paradigm was the second phase the concept of vulnerability entered the risk scene protection was defined not only according to the physical protection system built but also according to the people's behavior this inclusion of people's behavior led to the design and use of early warning system and educational programs about hazards and how to protect against them this paradigm lasted for a couple of decades and was even used during the yokohama strategy and plan of action for a safer world where all the efforts were aimed towards increasing our scientific knowledge about the causes and consequences of natural hazard and facilitates its wider application to reducing vulnerability of disaster prone communities this perspective include overall development are taking root causes and capacity building so this was the uh, second phase 
and then next phase was the complexity paradigm. A new understanding of the complex interaction between nature and society has emerged, and as such, a new complex approach to understanding risk has to be undertaken. Vulnerability is not only about groups or individuals, but it also embedded in complex and social relation and process. And some society, these three uh, paradigms goes parallelly also. They face the some scientists they are talking about. This is a totally natural phenomena. And there are some scientists and some social scientists they were talking about. No, the uh, disaster occurred because of the social uh, uh, crisis. So, uh, if you will look at the vulnerability definition, uh, the intrinsic and dynamic feature of an element at risk that determine the ex expected damage harm resulting from a given hazardous event and is often even affected by the harmful event itself. Vulnerability change continuously over time and is driven by physical, social, economic, and environmental factors. The potential to suffer harm or loss related to the capacity to anticipate a hazard, cope with it, resist it, and recover from its impact. Both vulnerability and its antithesis resilience are determined by physical, environmental, social, economic, political, cultural, and institutional factor. Vulnerability is related to the characteristics and circumstances of a community or system. These characteristics and circumstances make community or system susceptible to hazard and cause loss. There are many aspects of vulnerability arising from various physical, social, economic, and environmental factors. Examples may be include poor design and construction of building, inadequate protection of asset, lack of public information, and awareness, limited official recognition of risk and preparedness measures, and disregard for voice environmental management. If we generally look the extent to which a community structure, service, or geographic area is likely to be damaged or disrupted by the impact of particular hazard on account of their nature, construction, and proximity to hazardous terrain or a disaster prone area, that is known as the vulnerability. Uh, general connotation, vulnerability equal to exposure plus resistance plus resilience. Exposure at risk property and population. Both the things. Resistance, measure taken to prevent, avoid, or reduce loss. And resilience is ability to recover prior state or achieve desired post-disaster state. But vulnerability is a multi-dimensional. Vulnerability is not physical vulnerability. This into social, economic, environmental, institutional, human factors, in fact, psychological factors also define the inclusive aspect of vulnerability. This is a dynamic concept. Vulnerability change over time. If the coping capacity increase, if the resilience power increase of a particular community, the vulnerability level is totally changed. This is a scale dependent phenomena. Vulnerability can be expressed at different scale from human to household to community to country resolution. This is also a site specific. Each location might need its own approach. So that's why there is no uh, particular method which we can apply uh, uniformly to each situation. So vulnerability assessment is a site specific phenomena, but there are few um, uh, few impact vulnerabilities, which uh, because this is an inclusive aspect that we can uh, categorize human and social aspect. Some direct losses involved here, some indirect losses are involved here. Physical aspect of vulnerability, economic aspect, and then cultural environment. Uh, vulnerability mapping of uh, disaster. How to know our vulnerability in terms of disaster since this. Uh, this training program is going uh, in the context of institutional disaster management plan. So I'm just giving you the example of my own college. Uh, there are tools for vulnerability assessment, which uh, a general public if or, uh, or any institutions, officials, or uh, their part of office, people can do that assessment and they can prepare the map. So these are general methods. One is transect walk, walking systematically in the institution through the area and discussing on various aspects of the area. Select a transect line, more than one. Team with six to 10 staff members. 
so that you can get idea about the particular places, locations, how safe that is, how not safe that is, what is the importance of that place in the terms of uh, disaster management plan. Systematic walk with key informants through the institution to explore special differences. Land use zones by observing, asking, listening, informal interviews, and produ producing a task set diagram. Identify danger zone, vulnerable areas, evacuation sites, local resources used during emergency, human activities, controlling to vulnerability, etc. also can be uh, uh, marked there. Analysis of daily working condition of that particular institution. A study the type of that institution uh, is where is happening. Different activities is sped, is speeded in different uh, spread it in different areas of institution at different time. What are the different resources used by the people? Which is the most busy part of the institution, or which is uh, in a particular time? What is the place which is then we also can make a problem tree. Problem ho sakte. We can also look at that part. Vulnerability assessment involves uh, generally two, two aspects vulnerable population and vulnerable infrastructure of that particular institution. So, when we are trying to mapping the vulnerability, we need to ask two simple questions who are at risk and what is at risk in our institution? Uh, vulnerable population can be old age population, children, women, physically handicapped. Mentally challenged people, visually handicapped, and poor people. Vulnerable infrastructure and asset can be non permanent structure, low lying areas if it is say, unindicated places, documents, machines, communication and transport network, and unplanned structure. Then, uh, vulnerability mapping we can uh, see. Vulnerability mapping usually entails the mapping of exposure, sensitivity, and coping capacity indicators. The greater the exposure of or sensitivity of a system, the greater the vulnerability, and conversely, the greater the coping capacity. The less vulnerable the system will be. Uh, vulnerability mapping reveals areas that are likely to be at greater risk or disaster in the future through integration of climate biophysical and socioeconomic data in an overall vulnerability framework, so-called hotspot of vulnerability can be identified. These maps can be used as an aid to targeting adaptation and disaster risk management and interventions. The focus is on the integration of remotely sensed and socioeconomic data. Data inputs include a range of sensor data, uh, and there are lots of softwares and we can apply that with lots of data sources as well as high resolution poverty conflict and infrastructure data two basic method can be used one in which each layer was transformed into rise indicator in an adopt, uh, additive approach and another in which remote sensing data were used to contextualize the result of composite indicators so both the thing statistics thing and uh, remote sensing data can, should be much in this vulnerability mapping. I'm just uh, giving you the case study, which actually the student uh, did uh, during the disaster practical man uh, practical paper in our college. Uh, this is our college, Shahid Bhagat Singh College, is a co-educational institute, which was established in 1967. Shahid Bhagat Singh College, University of Delhi, comes under the southern campus of the University of Delhi, located at south of Delhi, Sheikh Sarai phase. Uh, this is his uh, location. It is located into a highly urbanized and populated residential area. College has approximately yearly, this is 3,000 students generally uh, take admission and remain there. And the staff members, it has two different shifts in morning and evening, which separately run. College here is one boundary to College of Vocational Studies, where there is a big amount of students and the staffs are there. So, this is the location. Now, uh, map of college. Uh, so they the student generally uh, did a task walk college building together. The college have different areas, rooms and block, majority classified into following major parts. There is one academic block, sport ground, green area, uh, environment related area, and the, there are some few other areas, as a NCCA, sport room, staff parking here. Uh, so these area also they did the transit work. 
so this was very actually interesting exercise because uh, generally students come and they sit in the classroom goes to the canteen and uh, uh, eat and chat and then study and go but they never uh, try to look at the the place where they spend their uh, five to six hours any day or sometimes more uh, uh, so what what are what can they face if a disaster so when they did this, this was very interesting to them. So they actually were, got very interested in these uh, activities. So they prepare these maps also. Uh, then uh, detail of courses. So they uh, prepare this map, uh, the area they uh, got, and they prepare this map, uh, detail of courses. Then uh, they started looking at what is the profile of the uh, college so that college offer undergraduate and postgraduate courses at the undergraduate level it offers three year degree in commerce ba program english economic hindi history geography political science and mathematics at the postgraduate level it offer an mcom course uh, and then college is mainly uh, famous for the commerce so what is the profile of uh, so they collected the data of a student ki how many students are there in the college uh, then they uh, also got the detail of staff members teaching and non-teaching staff members and then they did this vulnerability assessment uh, this include the uh, they use that this hrvc uh, cycle analysis is found to be proven powerful technique and it is really very powerful technique hazard we already know the potential danger to a human induced threat so they took this also then risk then vulnerability and in capacity also in terms of uh, college. So they did the hazard assessment and uh, took very small, small uh, indicators like experience any disaster in college. This did the primary survey and got the data. Uh, then identification potential and non-structural hazard. And they found there are two hazard can be uh, have, can occur in the college. Uh, one is the earthquake and another is the fire. Then uh, they did a vulnerability assessment. Uh, since we talk about two types of vulnerability, physical infrastructure vulnerability and population vulnerability. So they took uh, small things like infrastructure, how that building is there, fitting and fixture of the college, escape plan availability, local warning system, installation and inspection of extinguishers, cylinder monitored, sound alarm, disaster management committees there, mock drills are happening, medical centers. So a primary survey they done. And they also look at the population vulnerability. They collected the data about the physically uh, disabled students and uh, the other indicators also. And then they prepare the uh, vulnerability map of the college. One for the earthquake or one for the uh, fire disaster. Uh, then they also do the risk analysis. Uh, which is based on the threat, vulnerability, and asset. When the asset come in the context of threat and vulnerability, then it become the uh, risk area. So they, they also did the risk analysis and they um, mark the low risk zone, uh, which were like playground, garden area, central lawn, staff parking, front lawn, other areas. Then they also saw the medium risk zone and mark them. Uh, this area uh, mainly new constructed building with disaster resistance material. So there were some blocks were there. Then high risk zone also they found these areas more vulnerable. Jo thodi purani buildings the. So uh, they found and they marked it. Then they also prepare the evacuation plan. An evacuation plan that is spelled out and shared with your other member well in advance is a good strategy for success and overall safety in case of disaster. So if you prepare a vacation plan and if you are aware about that, then it will uh, provide you a lot of uh, safety uh, uh, in the context of any mishappening or the disaster. It, it has to be considered that where you will go and how you will get there, how you will stay in touch and who will know where you are. It is recommended that the chain of command is clearly detailed and is available so that all staff and the students are aware of who is responsible for oversight during an emergency. As an emergency plan is developed, one of the first issues faced is the decision as to whether an evacuation of the premises will be required. And this is decision is frequently influenced by the level of threat involved. 
a notification protocol chart establishing emergency threat level should be de uh, developed to help differentiate the impact of a given emergency from a geographical perspective. So, uh, we also uh, during this exercise with the student, we also found these are very important aspects to be done by the college. And later, the college started the Center for Disaster Management Study, which is uh, very good uh, things are going on there. Basic goals of plan. The basic goals of any disaster and emergency plan should include these elements. So the student understood that mitigation, preparedness, responses, and recovery are involved in that uh, evacuation map. It's not an evacuation map. It's give the whole vision about that if a disaster occur. So which are the ways where to go? Uh, what thing can be do? Uh, what are the safest place? Uh, they found that these are the safest place where they can uh, go that particular disaster if it if it happened anytime. Uh, but this is exercise was based on that little bit of understanding of the Q and R J S. But I feel that if the people are not aware about any mapping exercises, then also they can utilize lots of uh, material and information is available on the government sites. Uh, this vulnerability atlas I found very interesting because this is a online atlas and wherever you click, click you can uh, uh, identify which is the most vulnerable area in your surrounding. So these things can be also utilized the people who are not known, uh, not aware about the mapping or the institution which are also not can create or not generate their own particular map. So they can take either the help of uh, some specialist or they can use these uh, uh, these uh, websites also to take the help. Uh, there are vulnerability mapping analysis platform too that turns complex socio demographic, environmental, and uh, medical data into applied tools for emergency and crisis management decision makers by utilizing the most appropriate scientific method. So, just put any other data has to so they can use these kind of software also to generate their work. Uh, so, this is all about uh, this is I just uh, presented the case study which we used to do in either in the nearby area or some places. So, this is the college mapping done by our own student. So I thought to share with you because we are generally talking about the institution management plan, and this was a very good exercise because there was lots of learning involved with the student. They learn, uh, otherwise they were not able to look at those places, but they went, they clicked the picture, ki kaun si jaga pe wiring thik nahi hai, kaun si jaga pe fire extinguisher nahi hai, where is the, uh, this fire signal uh, alarm is uh, uh, installed in the college, Earlier, they were not used to aware that then they got to know, okay, this uh, facilities are there, there are more drills are going on, their training programs are going on, and it increases day by day in our college. So, thank you very much. Thank you so much, ma'am, uh, for such an informative presentation. You started with the with the inspiration from Sendai framework. If you fail to prepare, you prepare to fail. Then, uh, ma'am went on to uh, discussing about uh, risk uh, dimensions, risk management assessment, then vulnerability assessment, vulnerability management, and most importantly at the end, uh, she has beautifully described the case study of our own college, and that could be a blueprint for uh, for many, uh, you know, campus management related to uh, disaster risk prediction. So thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, now I would uh, like to ask the audience uh, if they have any questions can put the question in chat box. Yeah, Dr. Ganesh, may I? Yes, yes, ma'am, please. So thank you very much, uh, ma'am, for, for this insightful presentation. And I'm delighted to know that Shahid Bhagat Singh College has, has done some sort of exercise for preparing this kind of plan. And I just had certain questions, like I want to know that when this exercise was done, I mean, how much time ago, maybe before pandemic or something? Yes, ma'am. It was actually we done uh, when uh, uh, we got this paper, practical paper, disaster management studies introduced uh, in our syllabus, and that was in 2018. So we did that exercise, and later on in later years, uh, before pandemic, we also did the exercise for nearby locality Chirag Delhi. Then we also did for the Sheikh Sarai. Then we also went little bit of further um, Saket. 
so these exercise we did and then pandemic started so we gave that online mode of uh, case studies to do the uh, practical one very nice initiatives actually we should keep on doing such initiatives that enhances not only our own capability but also we are aware the people who are living near to our institution so uh, actually your plan i wanted to know what were the issues basically uh, uh, faced during the exercise like uh, in while conducting the exercise and after that what was the action uh, what was the outcome of that exercise and what was the action plan of the college yes ma'am uh, since that paper was introduced first time so uh, basically everybody was little bit had that awareness that uh, disaster is a very important area but that uh, planning was not there like uh, when the student uh, went to the principal office they asked that thing then principal uh, our principal was also that time realized that it was like a academic exercise uh -huh. okay. there are few things are missing like uh, uh, fire extinguishers were not working the fire bell was not working then the wiring was in some classes were not perfect and then there was some area which were damp so uh, the then our principal and authority was also realized and they took this initiative ma'am this is a very good uh, outcome happened that cdms started after that and then okay. he initiated that we should uh, open a center for disaster management study in our uh, college and it was started and uh, the founder director was dr vab raman and now ma'am is in charge and she is doing lots of things there uh, and in fact now offline mode is just started and ma'am is planning so many things mock drill and all other things are happening earlier also before pandemic so there are lots of activities after that uh, started and it was happening because uh, the student learned so many things as i said earlier in the during the presentation also the people uh, student used to come and go but they were not uh, able to take that thing uh, in their imagination ki uh, agar kabhi aisa hoga to where will they go so that thing came into the mind of the people yes. and i believe that such exercises should be like a compulsory sort of thing for every like the newcomers of the college at least the the freshers <laughs> they should be inducted uh -huh. Uh, on the disaster management aspect yes, of the now college. Yes, ma'am. Now, CDMS because... is doing lots of things. Yes. Hmm. Yeah, Applying. I would add a point here. Um, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Kavita, if you remember, uh, you also did the uh, fire exercise with the students. Uh, that uh, Ch Chandni Chowk fire, the factory fire. Yes, we went there. Yeah. Huh. Yes, we went there. We did the field work over there also. Uh, yes. There was so, a fire happened. Yes. Yes, so we are, uh, you know, uh, here what, what it uh, really uh, communicates, conveys the message is including the youth, that is the people's participatory approach. Let, you know, let people feel it, understand it and see it and do it themselves. So, yeah. uh, you know, this is the best way to bring in youth into the entire system that we are trying to target that you know the how disaster management should be seen just by you know um, buying uh, or making uh, certain aspects until unless they youth experience it themselves they cannot learn so making it part of their uh, system part of their uh, curriculum uh, that makes the entire difference so whether it's a small exercise or a bigger exercise, but how a student went to the field, they prepared, they work out. So that is the brilliant uh, thing Especially that the uh, practical experience counts more than the theory which we keep on teaching. Sometimes yes, practical exactly. and being a geographer in myself, I can understand that. Yes, yes. In practical experience uh, uh, teaches you much more than what you actually learn from the books. Absolutely, so, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Are there any questions, uh, Dr. Ganesh? Uh, Ma'am, uh, I don't think there are any questions. This is... All right. So, participants, uh, uh, I would request if uh, you are interested, we can go for a group photograph and you may please on the, your videos. Of course. Welcome, yes. welcome, Dr. Ganpati, for joining us back. I request the participants. Yes, you can switch on your camera as well. 
So whosoever. Uh, Shreyas, uh, kindly enable uh, the participants oh, that, to. Yes, yes, that comments. would be, that is wonderful. Yeah. That is adding some life to our entire discussions. <laughs> um, actually. Yes, I, I request all other members, uh, all other participants also to on uh, their videos. And also our uh, student team, technical team, please take these screenshots. Yes, yes, yes. The group photograph. That is wonderful. Really happy to see. Yes, I think everyone should switch on their yes, yes. Uh, videos. Yeah. It's, with, it's with like we're talking to the people actually. Yes, yes. <laughs> Otherwise, sometimes you don't realize when it is a virtual mode and you don't connect with the person. Yes, These yes, participants, ab absolutely. Open your cameras. Dear participants, please open your cameras. Yes, now I can take this screenshot. And I, I request our uh, technical team students, please uh, take the screenshots. Very nice. We are really able to capture many of uh, the screenshots. Really. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Uh, share. Thank you so much. Can you please yes. share the citation? Share the screen. Yes, yes, yes. So, ma'am, uh, team NIDM and CDMS Sahir Bhagat Singh College proudly present the certificate of appreciation as a token of respect and gratitude to you. Kindly accept, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. So, Thank you so much. I think, ma'am, we should uh, wrap up the session now. Yes, towards the end, I just... Uh, again, want to thank all the uh, participants, especially for joining today, the second day of the program. And uh, uh, actually, this is a three days training program, and we have a certificate of participation attached to it. And for that, to get that certificate, everybody has to uh, attend the three days proceeding. And I think 60 70% of their uh, attendance is compulsory yes, yes, for mandatory. getting this certificate. So it would, uh, that's why I would request all of you to please join. And also tomorrow we, we will have a feedback session. We will allow our participants to talk to our panelists as well. And uh, uh, we will also uh, collect the online uh, feedback, which is feedback. compulsory before releasing any certificate. And that certificate will be received by you after maybe 10 days or something. So please be, have patience and uh if in that case you don't receive then you can i mean write to uh, any of us and we can see if there is any problem thank you so much so over to you mr mr, mr. ahmed shamir you want to say something i don't know there is a participant he is trying to speak something if he can talk no to i him. think he is not okay okay he's talking to somebody uh Thank you so much, uh, uh, all the participants, and of course, the speakers uh, of uh, today, uh, Professor Ganapati, uh, for an amazing uh, and a very brilliant um, uh, presentation and a lot of examples uh, and various work that your campus is doing, which is creating more of more interest into us uh, that uh, we really need to have not an hour session, we uh, should be having uh, probably a workshop where uh, two or three days detailed workshop we can work on. So we'll be working towards that. And also uh, our uh, session two speaker, Professor Kavita Arora, uh, thank you so much for joining us and sparing your time uh, and sharing uh, what, uh, you know, at uh, Shahid Bhagat Singh College Geography and Center for Disaster Management, what are the different things that we are doing and how important the mapping, understanding, involving youth and making people learn 
life learning life is really really important that is what is the uh, you know the main motto uh, with that that cdms is working towards uh, and i think you know that is the overall country's motto that people's participatory approach and making the youth bringing into the mainstream of um, the important areas of this kind with these words i thank you everyone and we would tomorrow the day 3 the final day of our 3 day training session and it's going to be a wonderful uh, we have speakers and we also have the panel session and the feedback with from the participants thank you so much thank you thank you so much everyone have a nice day thank you